I'm glad you're here. I did a Google search for the term Sabbath day. And there was 42 million hits. Pretty popular topic, apparently. Uh, the definition on the Wikipedia page, or whatever that's worth, Sabbath day is defined there as generally a day of worship for Jews and Christians, although on different days. I find that to be an interesting definition. Are they right? Is that a correct definition for Sabbath day? As some have suggested, is Sunday the Christian Sabbath, as Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath? Is that the only distinction? The fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments was to honor the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. And interestingly, not by accident, I don't believe, that commandment is the only one of the ten that is not restated, either directly or indirectly, in the New Testament. So the question we might ask is, are we bound to honor the Sabbath? And, what, and if we are, what, what does that mean to do that? I want to suggest to you today, if we look at uh, as we examine the Sabbath, that it was always more than just a day of worship. The Sabbath was a big concept, one that is very deep and very rich, and also one that does indeed flow into the New Testament. I want to also point out to you that the Sabbath, the principle, came long before the law of Moses was given on Mount Sinai to the Israelites that had come out of Egyptian bondage. And that was the promise of the rest of the land of Canaan. That was the promised land they were going to. That was referred to also as, as that rest, that Sabbath. But that promise came long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had sojourned. And it came after 420 years of bondage in Egypt. And that was what was coming to them. That was the promise that was made to them of that rest. But we too eagerly await a time of rest. But the rest that we are seeking is an eternal rest. Uh, in this series that we have uh, begun a couple of weeks ago about the better things found in the epistle to the Hebrews, uh, in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, the Hebrew writer talks about the Sabbath rest and what that means for us. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who had believed do enter that rest, as he has said, So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. The thought we're going to pursue this morning is that the rest for the Christian is based upon the Old Testament Sabbath. And we must understand what it is and also what it is not, so that we might better appreciate how much better our eternal rest will be. That is the purpose, again, of the Hebrew writer, to show that anything found previous to the new covenant in Jesus Christ is far inferior to that which Christ has brought, and that includes the rest 
that was promised to the people of God. And we'll examine that this morning. There is so much confusion over the Sabbath that it might be helpful to begin with to, to weed out and eliminate some of the possibilities so that we can make some kind of determination about this. So let's first look at what the Sabbath is not. And it's very clear from the scriptures that the Sabbath is not Sunday. It is not the first day of the week. It is not the day of the New Testament church worship. There are those who are Christians who uh, we might refer to as Sabbatarians. And what they say is that Christians ought to worship on Saturday, on the Sabbath day. They suggest, they, they say that the Catholic Church changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. And what really happened way back in 321 AD, when the Emperor Constantine became converted to Christianity, the Emperor Constantine made Sunday a public holiday. That means that you would not do any work. Saturday, the Sabbath, was not a holiday before that time, either to the Romans or to Christians. Jews were still worshiping on the Sabbath, those who still held to the Old Testament. But Saturday was not a holiday for the Romans or for the Christians. So the emperor didn't change it, he added it, he introduced it. And he did this because Christians were, at that time, already assembling to worship on Sunday. Constantine only recognized that fact and made an allowance that Sunday would be a day uh, where there was no work. We know that that was not the case prior to this because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for example, as Paul is, is teaching the church there about uh, problems they were having with the communion, with the Lord's Supper, he rebukes them because they were not waiting for everyone to get there. Logically, we can infer that there were some who had to work on Sunday. It was a regular work day. They had to work. And some were getting to the wherever the church was assembling, and they were not waiting for the others to get there. So it was not a day that had been set aside already of no work uh, in the way that we understand it today. So note the Catholic Church, or even Emperor Constantine, did not change the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday, but simply recognized that Christians were already meeting on Sunday and worshiping it. In Exodus chapter 31 and verse 13, Moses is very clear that the sign of the Sabbath, the significance of it, the symbolism of it, was given only to Israel, only to the nation of Israel, not to the Gentiles, not to any non-Jew. That would include Christians. The Sabbath was a sign that was given only to Israel and was only ever to be assigned to Israel. The question we want to ask is, if Sunday is the new Sabbath command, as some have suggested, why are there no instructions? If you look in the Old Testament, the instructions on what you could do on the Sabbath day and what you couldn't was very, very detailed, very regulated. Now, if the New Covenant is superior to the Old Covenant, which it clearly is, that's the whole purpose of the Hebrew epistle, then certainly there would be even more clear instructions, even more detailed regulations about how to make sure we're doing it right, if everything is better, but there is not. One thing that we know, we know the Sabbath is not Sunday. A second thing we know is that the Sabbath rest is not referring to the land of Canaan. If we look in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 21, Moses leads Israel out of Egyptian bondage. He leads them to the, uh, the Jordan River. And just before they cross over, God has told Moses that he's not going to enter the promised land. He dies. Joshua is going to lead Israel into the promised land. Joshua does this. They fight many battles. They conquer the land of Canaan that God had promised to give to them, and they have that rest. In Joshua chapter 21, and verse 43, it says, After all this happened, so the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. There are some today, uh, some aspects of premillennial, premillennialism that say that the land promise was not fully given to Israel. They only got part of it. But Joshua says here that that has all been fulfilled. All the land that God promised to give to them was given, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. There's no remaining land promise to be given. But when we see what the Hebrew writer said regarding that, 
And he mentioned Joshua. He said in verse 8 of Hebrews 4, If Joshua had given them rest, if that was the Sabbath rest that, that God was talking about all along, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. But he did. After Joshua, he said, No, there's another rest coming. That's not the end all be all. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 8, when it says, If Joshua had given them rest, he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. That word another is very important. Buckle your safety belts. We're entering Greek territory. Very briefly, we're just going to graze into the Greek for a moment. But the Greek word for another here is a word that means different. It means another, not of the same kind, but like, you know, well, I did this one thing and then I did another thing. Very similar to it. It's not that word different. It means, uh, or, or it's similar. It's a word that means different. Another of a different kind. It's an opposite. Uh, so she was speaking of a different kind of rest is what that word tells us. In verse 9 of Hebrews 4, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. That means it hasn't come yet in the time of Joshua. It hasn't come yet in the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews. It hasn't come yet. Something else coming. The word rest that is used there in the New Testament Greek, in the original writing, is the word sabbatismos. You see very close connection to the word sabbath. That is the only time this word is used in the entire New Testament, right here in this one verse. Therefore, there remains a rest for the people of God, this very unique word. Everywhere else in the New Testament, you see the word sabbath, it's the word sabbaton. Similar, but a different form. It's a different word here. And every other time in Hebrews chapter 4, if you look through Hebrews chapter 4, you'll see the word rest used, I don't know, 10 or 12 times. Every time the word rest in Hebrews chapter 4 is used, it's a completely different word. It's the word katapawo, kind of a mouthful. That is what the word rest is translated, except at this time in verse 9. So there's something different going on. That's what we need to pay attention to. In verse 11, when the Hebrew writer says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. It is in contrast to the rest that was found in verse 9. Something different. Something new. So we've seen what the Sabbath is not. It's not Sunday. It's not the promised rest in the land of Canaan. If the Sabbath rest of the Christian is something new and different from the Old Testament Sabbath, let's look and see exactly what it is then. And what we see as we look at what the Sabbath is, there, there is a progression of a concept throughout the entire Bible. First, we need to understand that the Sabbath command was not given to Adam and Eve by God. Again, some have claimed that. They say that, that God gave the Sabbath command to Adam and Eve by his example when he rested on the seventh day. But that is incorrect. God's resting on the seventh day is simply recorded. It is simply described. This is what God did, and that's it. There was no command given in connection to it. What it does is it sets a precedent for Moses to refer back to when the Sabbath command is given. He says, we've got a new command here to rest on the Sabbath day. You remember, like God did during the creation week. We also see the principle continue to develop. The command was not given to Adam and Eve. In Exodus chapter 16, Moses has led Israel out of Egyptian bondage, and God is going to provide manna for them. He's going to find the little flakes of bread and things for them to eat on the, on the ground every day. And he says, every morning, <coughs> every morning you're going to get up and gather this manna, except on Friday. What's Friday? The day before the Sabbath. He says, on Friday you're going to go out and gather twice as much on Friday. Then you're going to take it back to your tents so that you don't have to go out on Saturday. Why? Well, he hasn't explained why yet. He just says, this is the command. Gather twice as much on Friday. You don't have to go and gather any out on Saturday. Don't want anybody out gathering the manna. And don't worry, it'll last two days. That principle continues to grow and develop. And then the command is made official. In Exodus chapter 20, 
with the giving of the law, particularly the giving of the Ten Commandments, including that fourth commandment, to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, as you remember how God rested from his work on the seventh day, so you also will rest from your work on the seventh day. Now the command has officially been given, and it is a period of weekly rest. Uh, so they're not just working themselves to death. A period of weekly rest, a period of meditation, worship of God, of course. And then we see that command of the Sabbath rest that God has given them each week, one day a week, to set aside, to rest, to recover themselves, to devote time to God. Then there is this promised rest of the land of Canaan, which is where they're going. They're on their way to Canaan. He says when you get to that land, there's going to be a, another type of rest. A rest from the bondage of slavery that they've been in for 420 years. There's going to be a rest from the wandering. They've wandered for 40 years before finally entering the promised land. There will be a rest from that in the land of Canaan. There will be a rest from warfare. Once they've fought the battles to conquer the land, God is going to protect them. He's going to give them peace and they will have rest. And a place for them to have a home. They haven't had a home. They've been wanderers. And he says, you will have a rest from that wandering and you will finally have a home. So we see the, the principle, the, the concept is sort of growing and developing here. The Old Testament prophets referred to a time of rest when Messiah would come. Messiah would bring a period of rest. In Isaiah chapter 11, in verse 10, And in that day, the time of Messiah, there shall be a root or branch of Jesse. This is referring to the, the family of David, of which Jesus was a descendant. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles shall seek him. And his resting place shall be glorious. That's just one of many verses that refer to the rest that would come in the time of Messiah. There's a reference later that in, in this time of rest, in this time of peace, that the, the wolf will lie down with the lamb and a child will be able to put their hand into a, 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 you know, the, 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 the hole of serpents and the serpents won't bite them. There will be peace. There will be an absence of conflict. The Hebrew writer in chapter 4 was quoting from uh, Psalm 95 when he refers to David. In verse 7, he refers to a writing of David. He's quoting from Psalm 95. And he's quoting that passage to make his point. That there's something else coming. Something else. David lived under the Old Covenant. He had experienced the rest of Canaan, the Sabbath, the weekly observance of uh, of the day of rest and worshiping God, but he said there's something else. He's teaching about something new, something different that is to come. And he quotes David pointing to another kind of rest that some Israelites had yet to enter. So it can't be the Sabbath. It can't be the Sabbath command. It can't be Canaan because Israel had entered both of those rests when David wrote it what he wrote in Psalm 95. He's warning them against hardening their heart against this new rest that will come. Because hardening their heart will prohibit their entrance into it. Just as a hardened and disobedient heart kept some of the rebels out of the land of Canaan in the time of Moses. Alright. So this rest is something new that is to come. Where is this rest to be? This rest will be found in the kingdom of heaven. This rest is where Jesus is. What he referred to in John chapter 14. Verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And we sing in one of our hymns, Oh, for a home with God, a place in His courts to rest. There will be rest in heaven. It's where Jesus is. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34, Jesus was talking about the judgment scene there, how there will be a separation. How there will be the sheep will be on the right and the goats will be on the left. And He says, The sheep on the right will inherit the place prepared for them, before the foundation of the world, that place of eternal rest. All right, well, what is this rest going to be like? 
In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 10, we see that life is a labor, the work that we do here. There will be a rest from that labor, just as the, just as the Jews rested on Saturday, on the Sabbath. From their weekly work, there will be rest from the labors of this earthly life in a, in a, in a broader, more eternal sense. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 that we were created for good works, that we might walk in them. Has it been hard work to walk in those good works of God? Has it been hard work to resist temptation, to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing, which is often the easier choice? I can only speak for myself and say, yes, it's been hard work. And it will continue to be hard work as long as we breathe on this earth. But in heaven, in that eternal rest, that hard work will be over. This rest will also mean that, that there is a rest from labors after our death. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, words of hope we have here. Revelation 14 and verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. That's one of the blessings of heaven. Relief from the struggle of this life, from that spiritual struggle against self and against sin. That will be over. Also words of encouragement there that, uh, that our works will follow us, that there will be a reward, that God takes notice of those things that we're doing in order to obey Him. Jesus warned His disciples back in John chapter 9 and verse 4. He said we need to work, we need to be busy because while it is still daylight, he said we need to work because night is coming when no one will work. When we die physically, our work day is done. <coughs> when we see the descriptions of the rest of heaven, it sounds pretty good to us, doesn't it? No more tears, no more pain, no more sickness, no more sin. That's the rest that God has promised us. Well, we know that some were not able to enter the rest of Canaan. So how can we make sure that we aren't left out of God's eternal place of rest? That's what the Hebrew writer is suggesting there by quoting from Moses and from David. Rebellion against God's command and a hardened heart kept them out of the land of Canaan, that rest. How can we make sure we aren't left out of God's eternal place of rest? So we've seen what the Sabbath is, what the rest is. Uh, we've seen what it, what it isn't and what it is, but now we need to learn how to enter it. How do we get into this rest? We, we don't want to be left out. We want to be in there. So how do we enter it? This rest is found only through Jesus. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, comforting words from the Savior when He says, Come to Me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus had said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The rest is only found through Jesus, we can only enter it through Him, that one way. Going back to Hebrews chapter 4, passage where we began, verse 3, it says, We who have believed do enter that rest. We enter it by being believers. Down in verse 9, there remains a rest, therefore, for the people of God. We need to be the people of God if we're going to enter that rest. Verse 6 says that disobedience is what keeps you out. If that's true, and it is, if disobedience keeps you out, then obedience is what gets you in. Obedience to what? The gospel. We obey the gospel. The first gospel sermon that was preached in the New Testament was in Acts chapter 2. The crowd that heard this message from Peter and the other apostles asked, 
What shall we do that we might avoid the wrath of God? That we might enter this rest? Peter says, repent and be baptized. And every person in Acts that we see after that obeys this, uh, the gospel in the same way. They repent of sin, believe, showing their belief in Christ, and they're baptized, immersed in water. When I was in Jamaica, uh, there's quite a bit of, of Seventh-day Adventism down there, and we, met, we studied with several people of that background. And I remember studying with a certain group of them, and we were trying to determine what the Sabbath was. You know, the Sabbath command, that's one of the major sticking points there, and points of disagreement. And one of the ladies was, was adamant that the Sabbath that is talking about here in Hebrews 4, that remains, that, that has yet to be seen, that is coming, the Sabbath rest that awaits the faithful Christian is a reinstatement of worship on Saturday. And I said, are you sure about that? The Sabbath rest that is promised here in Hebrews 4, she said, was the reinstatement of worshiping on Saturday. And I said, you can have Saturday if you want, if that's what you're hoping for. I'd rather have heaven personally. I want the Sabbath rest of heaven. I don't want the Sabbath rest of Saturday during my work week. I want the Sabbath rest of heaven. The rest that was provided in Canaan to Israel wasn't perfect because it wasn't permanent. Israel was never at peace for very long. They were even taken completely out of the promised land of rest because of their sin. And because of their rebellion against God. The heavenly rest is far, far better because it will last forever. There will be no opportunity to rebel against God and lose it. And be found outside. There will be no sin. There will be no temptation. Some did not enter the rest of Canaan because of their disobedience. Many, sadly, will not enter heaven. The heavenly rest, because of their disobedience. I would urge you today, don't miss out on this place of eternal rest that God has prepared for you. If you will obey, if you will believe and obey, and if you will submit to be baptized, so your sins might be washed away, then you will become a child of God. You will be the people of God to whom this rest was promised. God has made this for you. He's waiting for you. He wants it for you. Want it for yourself today. Obey those commands. Have your sins forgiven. That you might have the hope of that promised eternal rest. If we can help you with that today, or if we can pray for you, then please come and make that need known to us as we stand and sing. Please come.